see. My time's expired. Thank you, Mr. Dingo. Um, Mr. Bradley, for questions, please. <laughs> Gentlemen, I don't think that's any coincidence that, with the exception of Mr. Walden, the remaining members all come from states that are represented in the Big Ten Conference. Our constituents built your cars and trucks, or in my case, they build tractors and combines and heavy equipment. And the workers who build those products are so brand loyal to your company that they have created a dominant market share for you and the U.S. auto sales that has lasted right up into this moment in history. And Mr. McElhaney and my uncle and my brother-in-law, who are Chevy dealers, advertise your products on Big Ten sports networks so that your products are sold in this area which you have this dominant brand loyalty in. And yet I look at page four, Mr. Henderson, of your proposal, and what do I see? Wind down dealers by state, Pennsylvania 90, Ohio 79, Illinois 66, Wisconsin 50, Michigan 58, Indiana 48, Iowa 46. And after your description of why these foreign automakers are not playing in this part of the country, I find it very difficult to believe that you will perpetuate your brand loyalty in light of these massive dealer closures in my state, in Representative Stupak and Congressman Dingle's state, in Congresswoman Sutton's state. I see the evaporation of your market share because of this practice. And I just wonder where, whether as part of your restructuring you have given consideration to that. Mr. Henderson? Sir, first of all, I'm a Wolverine, born in the state of Michigan. Uh, second of all, when we're done, uh, General Motors will still have what we believe will be the largest distribution system for rural and small towns in the U.S. Approximately 1,500 of our 3,600 dealers will be located in those small towns, and we do believe we'll be able to maintain a strong position. Sir. Actually, th through the, uh, the new dealer network, we've increased the share of dealers that are in rural markets. Uh, and reduce the share of dealers in, in uh, metro markets. We do realize the importance. Uh, the difficulty is uh, from our volume going from a peak of 2 million to 700,000, we don't produce enough vehicles to have every dealer stay in business. It's, it's, it's unfortunate, uh, but it's a fact, and we're trying to make sure that the dealers have a high enough volume that they can stay in business and have a good operation going forward to compete with the transplants. Well, with all due respect to the two of you who have accomplished much in your careers, I would submit that the, the people sitting on this side of the table have a much deeper sense for the attitude of our constituents, and I would be shocked to see your brand loyalty maintained in light of these shutdowns. Now, one of the things we know, Mr. Walden referenced this in his opening statement, is uh, companies, both companies have been doing advertising to talk about their business strategy going forward. And Mr. Henderson, we've seen the GM ads that talk about how your company is going to stand behind the products it sells going forward. But re in reality, you're not standing behind your products because one of the things we know is as part of these bankruptcy proceedings, every existing and future product liability claim that your company could be responsible for for selling a defective product is going to be extinguished. Isn't that true? In our case, uh, warranty, recall will all be assumed by the new company, but in the case of product liability, purchasers in the normal 363 process do not assume that sort of obligation. That's and so they will be extinguished in the bankruptcy. They would be unsecured claimants of the old General Motors. And they will be extinguished because we all know what happens to those unsecured claimants. Likely. Yes. Now, have you informed your dealer network that you're going to be passing on a massive cost shifting to them because of that? Uh, no, we're not going to be passing. Yes, you are, sir, because I can tell you in the state of Iowa, Mr. McElhaney is currently immune from liability as a distributor of your product if the manufacturer is in existence and is not in bankruptcy. That's the fact in almost every state under state product liability law. So if you disappear as a potential claimant in that process every one of these dealers is going to be on the hook not just your remaining dealer network but existing dealers that no longer have a franchise in our case uh, the both wind down, wind down agreements as well as the continuation agreements will be assumed by the new General Motors and the indemnification provisions that GM has today will continue 
the indemnification procedures. So you are going to assume responsibility and pass that liability on? As part of our obligation, we will continue to indemnify the dealers who sign a new agreement with new General Motors. And so they're going to have to rely upon you to step up after they've been sued, and they pass that on to you, and then they're going to have to have counsel involved because of that status. Sir, I think that by virtue of the indemnification continuing to the new company, we did that purposely to try to avoid the situation where a dealer could be badly, badly hurt. Now, Mr. McElhaney, I want to give you the last opportunity to talk about the impact on every one of the dealers that you represent as chairman of NADA who haven't had a seat at the table and haven't had an opportunity to tell their story because I'm guessing you've been getting a lot of phone calls. What's it been like for you, and what type of concerns are you hearing? Well, we're hearing many of the concerns that have been expressed earlier today by some of the dealers on this panel. They run the gamut. There are dealers that have most of their sometimes third, fourth generation. My family, as you know, has been in business for 95 years. Fortunately, we are going forward, but there are a lot of dealers like me that are not. Most dealers, their net worth of their enterprise, their life savings is represented in the real estate, if they in fact own it, and the value of their franchise. In the case of dealers being terminated by either GM or Chrysler, the franchise value is zero immediately, and the real estate value with single-purpose real estate, particularly in this commercial real estate market that is pretty stressed anyway, would be severely devalued even to the point where in many cases dealers will owe more money on the property than it's worth, or they may have a lease that they're obligated to for a number of years and have no way to generate revenue to pay for that lease. So those are some of the issues. There are dealers that have made significant investments in facilities with the expectation that they would have a franchise going forward as long as they met the requirements of the franchise agreement that are being left with those obligations. So there's just a myriad of stories that are very tough. Personal bankruptcies in many cases, dealers and their employees having to take personal bankruptcy, and the dealership employees we haven't talked a lot about, they are on average about twice what is paid in retail. So these are good jobs. Most of these people will not be able to go to other dealerships and find employment, particularly in this market, in a 10 million market. I don't know of any dealers that are hiring people. I suspect there may be some as this rationalization takes place and dealers have bigger market areas, but for the most part, those 120,000, 130,000 employees of terminated dealerships will have to find work probably outside the auto sector, and it's a tough market, as you well know, to find employment right now. So there's some pretty devastating stories out there. Thank you, Mr. Braley and Ms. Sutton. For questions, please. Thank you.